Good morning, everyone. I'm uh, uh, Dr. Natalia Vasquez. I'm a pediatric rheumatologist <clears throat> excuse me, at the Children's Hospital at Montefiore in the Bronx, New York. Um, my native language is Spanish as well. Uh, this is a conference in English, but please feel free to reach out after if you have any questions in Spanish. I'll be happy to talk to you. Um, today, I'm going to review, um, I'm going to provide an overview of localized scleroderma. Uh, there's so much I would like to talk to, but I had to summarize in 20 minutes. Um, and throughout the day, you'll hear more details about uh, treatment and uh, research. So this is the outline of what I'm going to review today. We're going to discuss what is localized scleroderma, why and how does it happen, who gets uh, localized scleroderma, how is it diagnosed, what are the different types, what are the different problems that can happen, and how do we treat it. So first, what is localized scleroderma? Um, we, I like to start um, understanding the words. Um, so scleroderma is derived from the Greek word scleros, which means hard, and derma, which means skin. So um, scleroderma means hard skin. And localized, we use that term to differentiate between the systemic form, uh, where localized primarily affects the skin and surrounding, surrounding tissue, uh, whereas the systemic form can affect uh, different systems, right? So it, it, it can affect internal organs. So that's why we put different words uh, to make it just a fancy name, medical name. Um, this disease is also known as morphia, um, a term that it's commonly used um, by uh, dermatologists. Um, so it makes it more complex, right? You hear different words for the same disease. This uh, disease is uh, known as an autoimmune disease. It's one of the autoimmune diseases. Again, uh, trying to understand the words autoimmune self or occurring from within. And what happens is that your own immune system uh, is misdirected to target yourself. Um, we'll go over uh, in more detail what does it means. Um, local, importantly, localized and systemic sclerosis are different diseases and localized scleroderma does not turn into systemic sclerosis. Very, very rarely some patients, very few patients can have uh, both forms of the disease. Um, so why and how does it happen? So we actually, we don't know. Um, so it's not your fault. There's nothing that you did that you shouldn't have. And there's nothing that you didn't that you should have done. Um, we do have some insights on how it happens, but again, there's still so much we have to understand because it's a rare disease. So studying the disease is very difficult. So we think that there's a genetic predisposition, meaning that there's some uh, genes that you carry uh, through and it's carried through your family um, that causes some dysfunction or uh, uh, activity of your immune system. So remember your, your genes are the ones that have the code of how your body should work. Um, and then there's some environmental trigger that uh, sort of like activates the disease. Um, we don't, we can't pinpoint to a specific trigger, but you know, there's some suggestion that some infections, some medications, some mechanical injuries as, such as injections or tattooing um, in adults, radiation therapy might uh, be a trigger. And then after this trigger, your immune system just starts acting um, in a dysregulated way. So it's not behaving at the way it should be. Um, so this is your normal immune system. Um, we have different cells. Uh, we have the white cells that um, work to fight infections. One, of the, one type of immu uh, immune cells are called, called lymphocytes. Within lymphocytes, there are different types of lymphocytes. Um, and these are your um, first line of defense. So there are T cells and B cells um, that we think are primarily involved in, uh, um, in the cause of autoimmune diseases. Um, the regulatory T cells also play an important role. These regulatory T cells help to make sure that other B or T cells don't attack your own cells. So it stops and it, you know if there is a cell that is not recognizing your body, the T cell should stop it. And then when there is activation of your immune system, when you know, you're trying to fight an infection, the regulatory T cells also stop that inflammation from happening. Um, so what happens in localized scleroderma um, is that your own cells, this is a B cell that produces antibodies, these Y-shaped proteins, um, and you'll hear us talking about antibodies a lot. Um, this is called a plasma cell. There is a specialized form of B cell 
So this type of cell, it's in charge of producing these antibodies that are, uh, let's say like tags or markers. So whenever there is a foreign body entering, entering um, to your body or a virus or a bacteria, um, these tags go and attach to them so that your other T cells or your immune uh, system cells go and identify them and eliminate that. Um, but what happens in autoimmune disease is that this happy B cell uh, gets confused and um, stops recognizing your own cells as your own um, and instead produces those antibodies. So we call those autoantibodies, right? Uh, uh, against yourself and produces damage in those cells. So the, the depend, depending on the different types of cells that are affected, we call it different names and different diseases. So in localized scleroderma or in scleroderma in general, the cells that are being um, affected are the cells of your skin and different tissues. Um, importantly is that there is a link between inflammation and in your immune system and cells in your skin that are called fibroblasts that help with healing. Um, and, and there is a link between those type of cells that we don't understand how they're linked. But when the immune system is activated, these fibroblasts get, get overactivated as well and produce a protein called collagen uh, that is the one that builds up the scar tissue. So that's how localized scleroderma happens. So who gets localized scleroderma? It's a rare disease. Uh, one to three out of 100,000 children develop localized scleroderma every year. Uh, it is estimated that 50 out of 100,000 children in the U.S. have the condition. Compared to other diseases, localized scleroderma is 17 times less common than juvenile arthritis, two to three times less common than lupus, but it's six to 10 times uh, more common than the systemic form. So the systemic form is even more rare. Um, this disease can happen at any age, so it has been described in babies and in adults, uh, but the average onset is between six to eight, eight years old, so it usually happens in the first decade of life. Um, it uh, affects girls slightly more common than boys. Um, how do we diagnose localized scleroderma? So it's a clinical diagnosis, meaning that it's based on patient symptoms and uh, the medical examination. There is no single test that can help us uh, diagnose it. Sometimes we order labs and imaging studies uh, to support the diagnosis, but also primarily to rule out other diseases, uh, but they're not always indicated. And then biopsy, um, it's um, taking a, a piece of tissue from the skin so that we can look at it in the microscope and we can confirm the diagnosis that way, but it's again, always not necessary. We only do it in cases that are uh, atypical or have, um, you know, signs that we don't, we are not sure if it's localized scleroderma. So these are the skin changes that can happen. Um, and these change, changes, um, uh, they change over time. Um, so localized scleroderma, different than systemic form, it usually limited to one side, but it's not uncommon that it affects both sides. Um, and the lesions can have uh, different forms, different colors. They can be of different sizes, different textures. Um, it may come in uh, lines or patches and they can have different colors depending on whether the lesion is active or inactive. So, you know, signs of activity or active inflammation is when the lesion looks uh, red or pink. Or may, it might look like bruises uh, or it might have like a whitish yellow color. So the pictures on the right shows examples of how the skin might look like initially when there is inflammation. Um, so uh, the type of uh, localized scleroderma that looks in patches may look like this and um, usually has a rim over it, erythema or redness and then a center that it has whitish yellow color where there is collagen um, causing excessive scarring or excessive tissue. Uh, this is another example where there is more collagen in the middle and then you see like the red around it. When the, when the lesion becomes inactive, that's when we see the damage sign. So the skin becomes lighter or darker, may look thin. Um, and you can see the veins or the vessels underneath because it becomes very thin. Um, the skin might have different textures. So it may feel like waxy or uh, rough or tight. Um, and a lot of patients may manifest some symptoms like itchiness or a lot of patients have, uh, they describe as having a funny feeling um, or very you know, nonspecific symptoms. 
what are the different types of localized scleroderma? So we classify these even more and make it more difficult for you to understand, but this is also helpful for us to, you know, direct treatment because different types are associated with different problems. Um, so the most common type in children is the linear form where you have band-like lesions, uh, usually longitudinal or vertical in the, in the trunk or the limbs, uh, sometimes the head or the face. Um, the circumscribed, the circumscribed means um, within, uh, within limits or uh, affecting a specific area. Um, so these are usually the oval or uh, circle type of lesions, um, and it can be seen in 15 to 30% of patients. Um, then there's the generalized form, which uh, essentially is sort of like the extended form or the circumscribed, where you can have uh, lesions coalescing to each other and affecting multiple areas of your body. Um, luckily, the panscleurotic, which is the most severe form, it's very infrequent. It's, it's seen in less than 1% of patients. And what is different about this one is that it can affect the limbs or, um, you know, arms or legs in a circumferential way. So instead of being a patch, it sort of like affects the skin circumferentially. And then the mixed form is the type of localized scleroderma where you can have like a combination of uh, two or more of these different types. And it's also very common in children compared to adults. Um, I'm gonna show uh, examples of the more, uh, most frequently types of localized morphia. Um, and the pictures are intended to educate you on how the lesions might look like, not to scare you. Um, so in the left, you see uh, a linear lesion affecting the right leg of this patient all over from the thigh to the foot. Um, and you could see this type of uh, localized scleroderma can affect deep tissues and is the type of disease that can have, uh, can cause, uh, you know, more problems and disability because it can affect the joints. Um, this type of uh, disease can also affect the head. Uh, so this is uh, a condition that we call in coup de sab um, that affects the forehead and it can be a linear lesion on the lateral side or on the middle. And this is important because it can affect deeper tissues uh, of the head. So it can affect the bone um, and um, you know, the, the brain. So it's very important that we monitor these patients very closely. Circumscribed morphia, it, there, is, there are two types. So the superficial where it affects only the outer layers of the skin and then the deep form, which can affect you know, the fat underneath the muscle um, and the lesions look depressed. So this is a patient laying on one side the feet are, he are here and the head is up there um, and it's affecting the upper part of the thigh and the glutes. Um, and you have the generalized form um, in children, it's usually unilateral. So that's why you see these two different patients that are having lesions on one side of the body. This patient has extensive lesions on the back of her uh, leg and it looked darker because the, the disease caused damage and is already inactive compared to this patient where you see some redness and, and that's indicative of uh, you know, active or active disease. So what are the different problems that can happen? Um, here's just a brief review. Uh, Dr. Lee will review more in more detail uh, the different types of problems. Um, but localized scleroderma can affect other structures outside of the skin. So the fat, the muscles, the joints, tendons, the nerves, or the bones. And internal organs are rarely seriously affected. Um, so it's not like systemic sclerosis where they have more risk for organ disease. And if they do have organ involvement, it's usually mild or asymptomatic. Uh, we refer to these problems as extracutaneous disease, so meaning problems that are caused outside of the skin. It's very frequent, so it can happen up to 25% of, of children, and it's a major cause of disability. So that's why pediatric rheumatologists should always be involved in the care of your child because we're trained to identify these problems. Um, the tissues that are affected are usually located near the affected skin, but sometimes um, it can be seen in distant places. So what are some of these changes that can happen outside of the skin? So when the joints are affected, uh, kids can have swelling or, or what we call arthritis or inflammation of the joint. Um, and with that, it, patients can have pain and tightness with movement uh, or what we refer as decreased range of motion where your child cannot bend completely um, the extremity or extend it fully. When it affects the muscles, uh, it causes myositis of what we refer as inflammation of the muscles. So the child can have pain and weakness and the leg might look smaller or less bulky. 
uh, when it affects the entire limb or the head, um, the limb might look smaller in length, length or girth, as you can see in this um, patient on the right. Um, and importantly, when patients have lesions on the head, uh, as I said, it may affect um, uh, the structures around it, right? So the eyes, the teeth, the jaw. So uh, patients might have problems related to the eye. Sometimes they can be inflammation inside the eye. Um, there can cause, um, you know, vision problems. Um, and in the mouth, it might cause um, uh, overcrowding of teeth. Um, so it's important that your child gets seen by an ophthalmologist or a doctor specializing in the eyes, a neurologist if there's any concerns of neurological involvement, and then the dentist should always be involved. Uh, because the nerves run deep in the tissues, if the lesions go deeper, um, then it might affect the nerves and patients might have symptoms such as pins and needles and some, sometimes muscle twitching. So how do we treat localized scleroderma? Um, unfortunately, there is no cure, but over the years, we have found very effective medications that can control the inflammation. So it's very important that the disease gets diagnosed when it's active so that we can stop the inflammation and prevent damage. So the treatment should be individualized to each of the, to the needs of each child because it, uh, you know, they all behave uh, different. Um, and it depends on the type of localized scleroderma they have, uh, the location of the lesions and how deep they are. Um, if there is involvement of air, it's outside the skin. Um, it depends also on the duration of disease and whether the disease is active or inactive and how much it impacts the quality of life. Um, and again, I am going to repeat this several times. A pediatric rheumatologist should always be involved in the care because even if it's just affecting the skin, um, the extracutaneous or other tissues might be involved years later, even 10 years later, and you should have a person trained in identifying these early so that complications can be prevented. So the goals of treatment are to decrease the inflammation, pain, itchiness, or any discomfort. Um, the treatment should always be directed to prevent functional impairment, uh, prevent or minimize any permanent damage, uh, allow your child to grow, nor grow normally, um, and always enhance and maintain a normal activity level and quality of life. Uh, because it happened in children that are growing, uh, you know, uh, we, we always have to have that in mind and, you know, help your child grow uh, and succeed. There are different treatment regimens. Um, um, the systemic immunosupp immunosuppressant medications are the most important ones. And then you have um, supportive or additional medications, such as creams that can um, help control the, the disease. Um, so this, what we refer to systemic immunosuppressants uh, is referring to um, suppress your immune system. We don't turn it off completely, but remember what it's causing all the inflammation is your immune system being on and active. So we need to suppress that at some level so that the, the inflammation is controlled. Um, Several studies have shown that these medications are very effective in controlling uh, inflammation. So these systemic immunosuppressant medications are required in most children with localized scleroderma. Only a few uh, children that have uh, uh, the outer layers of the skin only involved may be amenable to be treated just with creams. But again, most, most children would require these medications. Um, they can be given by mouth as injections or infusions. And the most commonly used include corticosteroid, methotrexate, and mycophenolate. Again, Dr. Lee will- oh, um, Sorry, about two minutes left in the presentation, if that's okay. Yeah, okay, Great, thanks. no problem. Um, and then there are other uh, adjunctive treatments such as creams, uh, light-based therapy, physical and occupational therapy are, are always important. And then when the disease is inactive, that's when surgeons can come in and help with uh, corrective surgery. Mental health support is always important and make sure that you discuss with your rheumatologist about school accommodations so that we can help uh, your child to succeed in school. So children do well. Over the past 20 years, since the introduction of methotrexate and advances in assessment, the prognosis have dramatically improved. And most children who receive timely and appropriate treatment have favorable prognosis. About a, a fourth of patients may have recurrence after treatment. Uh, but these numbers require further study. But in general, they do very well if they're treated properly. And I just want to thank the Scleroderma Foundation for organizing this event. To all of the participants today, my pediatric rheumatologist colleagues, and most importantly, my patients and families who always um, teach me about um, this disease and in ways um, to help you. Um, and 
with that, I will take questions. Great, so we, can, we definitely have some time for some verbal questions. There was one that came in in the chat um, from Nicole Arp and, um, and I apologize if I mispronounce anyone's name, please correct me. Um, did you wanna ask the question or would you prefer that I phrase it to Dr. Vasquez? Um, so the question there is, um, where are the most common places for lesions to appear on the face? Uh, that's a good question. So uh, most commonly the forehead is, is the, you know, the site that is more frequently affected. Uh, but there are kids that have a, a condition called Perry romberg syndrome where like half of the face might be affected as well. That, you know, that form is, is rare, fortunately. Um, but again, I think like probably the most frequent side is the forehead, sometimes the chin um, with linear lesions. Thank you. That was our one question that came in in the chat. So I would open it up to anyone that wants to um, pop off mute and ask a question directly or to pop a question into the chat and, and we can read and react to it. Yeah, there's a question of uh, how far in terms of years is it possible for recurrence and um, do you see a familial occurrence? That's a great question. So um, recurrence may vary, um, you know, most frequently it will uh, happen a year or two after treatment, uh, but it can happen five or 10 years later. So that's why I reinforce that, you know, rheumatologists, even in adulthood should always be involved to, you know, monitor for that. Uh, we don't see that this disease necessarily uh, passing generations. Uh, so it's not necessarily that your child, uh, your, the offsprings of your child will have the disease. So we don't, it's not like a strong hereditary disease, but again, like genes may be carried out through uh, several generations. Um, it's not necessarily uh, hereditary. Um, I just wanted to follow up on a question that I see coming coming up very, very frequently in the Facebook yep. group. One of your one of your comments or or statistics related to most children do require systemic treatment. Um, that's interesting because I am not sensing that most children with localized scleroderma are necessarily advised to start, or that's a question mark as to whether or not. Um, so, is there a cord now with dermatology as to whether most children should have systemic treatment or do you think that that's just emerging right now? Yeah, um, I think because um, a lot of these kids were treated by adult specialists, um, I think that's where um, uh, a lot of different approaches were being seen. Um, after finding that methotrexate became the standard treatment, we are seeing, uh, you know, a lot of improvement in prognosis. So that's where we um, got together. We're starting to talk more closely with, you know, other uh, specialists uh, on how to treat these patients. Also, a lot of the miscommunication came in from how the disease presents in adults. So it's very differently. You know, some adults are amenable to be treated with just creams and because providers were adult providers were treating children, um, that's where you know probably some patients are advised differently. But again, it's very important to highlight that these medications are very effective, and you should always be uh, consulting with a rheumatologist. We do have a few other questions in here. I'll jump to the first one that I've seen. Um, how many years are most kids with localized scleroderma on treatment? Um, it, it, it really depends on every child. We, um, we like to keep uh, children on medication at least for a year or two since the disease become inactive. So, you know, a lot of children, depending on the severity, may respond relatively quickly within the first six months. So when the disease becomes inactive, we start looking through one year or two of, you know, medications if the disease is well controlled. And then we have a conversation uh, then if we can start winning off or, or stopping medication. It, it really depends on how severe the disease is and what structures are being compromised, but minimum um, one or two years. 
Great. Um, another question here, what can cause a flare up? Yeah, that's a really good question. It's something that we're trying to understand. Um, it, you know, in general, in, in every autoimmune disease, we, we think that, you know, the same triggers. Uh, so, you know, an infection uh, may, may, may cause a flare. Uh, of course, if uh, medications are not being administered as we recommend, or the, you know, the child stops their medications, that's definitely... Uh, when disease flares can happen. Uh, but really we're, you know, that's, that's an area that we're investigating uh, what specifically and which patients are higher risk for flares. That's something that we're trying to understand. Thank you. And um, I see another question, the last one that I have on my list. Um, what conditions are, the, are patients more likely to have in adulthood, RA, et cetera? In adulthood, um, yeah. Again, uh, also we're trying to we're trying to understand uh, what happens uh, in in patients that had the disease starting in childhood. What happens in adults? Um, you know, that's some an area where we have very limited information. Um, but it you know it it can manifest as you know. Uh, the extracutaneous disease uh, that what I mentioned, right? Like, so the musculoskeletal problems such as arthritis, uh, if they had, you know, lesions on the face, like a lot of the neurological problems might come up later or inflammation in the eyes, you know, the frequency of those and who developed those is still an area that we don't understand fully. I don't have like exact numbers, but um, I'm gonna say that probably uh, it's, you know, the musculoskeletal or the joints and muscles um, uh, problems that may come up later. And um, just a word of warning, I, I know we're at 30 minutes and I'm pretty sure the room will close soon. So Scott will probably bring us all together. So we'll answer as many questions as we can. And I have a running list in case ones don't get answered that we can answer um, at a later time. Um, but the, we'll try to get in as many as possible. Um, the next one on my list, um, can you discuss options for leg length discrepancies when growth is asymmetrical? Um, it, yeah, so once we think that the disease is inactive uh, for you know several months, if not like a couple of years, um, there, there are other surgeons that can come in and help with you know, those uh, discrepancies and help uh, diminish those cosmetic uh, problems. Um, you know, unfortunately, when there's like a lot of damage happening, um, you know, there are certain problems that cannot be completely reversed, but, um, you know, orthopedic surgeons might um, discuss with you in ways of uh, how to make the leg look a little bit longer, uh, or the plastic surgeon might uh, give you options on um, making the tissue look, uh, you know, similar to the other side. So there are um, you know, different surgical techniques that can be uh, used to, you know, correct those cosmetic problems.